morning. Good morning. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, worshiping with our brothers and sisters in the name of Jesus Christ. I'd like to start off with a saying, whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey to Jesus, please know that you are most welcome here to receive God's goodness, his mercy, and his love. I like that uh, because I like to start off thinking about how we as a church, we want to be a safe place. For no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, this is a place that you can come. This is a video you can watch and hopefully experience the presence of God, have your lives changed. And uh, we know that God is good and he loves us and he's here today. We are gathered here in the name of Jesus. So let's sing about the love of God. It's going to be number 128 in that hymnal. Hymn? That's like aluminum. Hymnal. He loves me. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a God is in love with you. Sometimes it's hard to accept, but he is in love with you. Uh, the lectionary reading for this week in the gospel is in John chapter 20. And it says, Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. So Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to the disciples. But this guy named Thomas, the disciple named Thomas wasn't there. And the disciples go to Thomas and say, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. So in other words, until he actually touches Jesus and sees that the, the death marks are still on his body, he wasn't going to believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them this time. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. 
No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me now? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. So after reading that story of Thomas, who just had a tough time believing Jesus rose from the dead, my question is, do we believe? Do we believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Christ, he is God the Son, that he has risen from the dead? Do we believe? And so I must also ask, do we believe strong enough to let God control our prayer requests? You see, uh, we have these needs that we bring to God in prayer. And it's such a temptation to bring them to God in prayer and say, God, I believe in you, but I just can't take my hands off of it. I think this is what you need to do, God. Have you ever been guilty of that? Having a tough time surrendering the situation, the disease, the whatever to God and allowing God to be in control. But Jesus tells us to have faith. Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Believe that God is in control, that God is watching over us. Believe that God is going to get you through. And even if you don't see how, even if you don't understand how it could possibly happen, believe. Believe that God is still God and God loves us. As we sang, he loves us so much. Let's pray. Father, I I thank you, Lord for being here in this place with us today. You told us that where two or more are gathered, you are here. And we believe that the presence of God is here today through the power and the anointing and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we open ourselves up to you and say, Holy Spirit, please come. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our hearts, God. We give it all to you. We take our hands off of every prayer need, everything, Lord, that is heavy on our hearts today. Many of us are, uh, are dealing with stress. Some of us are overwhelmed and not sure how things are going to work out. But even so, Lord, help us to trust, help us to believe. We don't need to see how it will all work out. All we need to do is believe in you. You are awesome, God. You are glorious and you are mighty. And we believe and trust in you. And we ask you, Lord, increase our faith so that we can lean fully on the name of Jesus Christ. That's the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Now in the hymnal, number 129. Number 129, covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. darkest night I was wandering alone a stranger to mercy I stood but the Savior came nigh when he heard my faint cry and he put my sins Why his life fell on Calvary? 
comes to my heart and removes every care. He bears all my cumbering load. Amen. Pathway replete with his love are my feet since he put my sins under the so vast, my sins so vast, they are blotted out at last. Here you go. I got one. You're welcome. Now this is something um, I haven't done for a while, but uh, we have a certain statement of beliefs that we believe in the Church of Nazarene. And I, every once in a while, just to remind us of them, I like to go through them. I'll say them, and I say, do you agree and you say back to me, yes, I agree. Let's try it. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. All right. We believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. We believe that the Old and New Testaments were given by plenary inspiration and contain all truth necessary to have faith and for Christian living. Do you agree? We believe that human beings are born with a fallen, selfish nature and are therefore inclined to do evil and that continually unless they are changed. Do you believe? Yes, I believe. Well, that was weak. Do you believe? Yes, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> we believe that those who die without repenting are hopelessly and eternally lost. Do you agree? We believe that Jesus Christ died for the whole human race and that whosoever repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is justified and regenerated and saved from the dominion of sin. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. That was kind of weak, too. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Okay. Got a little competition going on this morning, I think. All right. These are important truths that we need to understand because they are what we believe as a church. And knowing what we believe as a church is important because uh, there's false teachings out there, right? There are cults. There are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, to use a biblical reference. So we need to know what we believe. So, um, we believe that believers are to be entirely sanctified after salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Do you believe? Yes, I believe. We believe that the Holy Spirit bears witness to the new birth and also to the entire sanctification of believers by showing us inwardly that we are saved and sanctified, filling our hearts with love, and he shows us outwardly through a holy life. Do you believe? Yes, I believe? We believe that our Lord will return, the dead will be raised, and the final judgment will take place. Do you believe? Yes, believe. And we believe that as Christians, our most important responsibility towards others is to give them God's love. This changes the way we behave online, the way we interact with others, the way we treat the homeless, the poor, the immigrant, the addict, and those who feel unloved and abandoned. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Let's see. Uh, one of the main reasons why we named our church Living Love Church Nazarene because we believe our great responsibility is to show people the love of God. If you have your Bibles, you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. Now, Jeremiah, he was an Old Testament prophet. He was not a bullfrog. 
Jeremiah was a prophet. Eh, eh, eh. It's kind of funny, not really. Okay. They don't get any better. <laughs> Jeremiah 31. 31. Have you ever been asked to do something that was impossible? Have you ever had people put on you impossible expectations? Sometimes in working with people that are recovering from trauma or abuse, they talk about having these impossible expectations put upon them. And thinking about that in, in the message today, we're looking at the Old Testament law. And sometimes, even today, laws seem impossible to fulfill. Like, take the speed limit. That's a recommended speed. Now, they'll say this is the law. This area is 55 miles per hour. This is the law. And you get a ticket for breaking the law. You know, And so they say it's the law, but how easy is it to drive 55? Not 56, not 54, going up and down hill. How easy it to, is it to stay right at 55? Is it impossible? Even with the cruise, I put my cruise on, it goes 56, 57, dropping down 53, 54. You know, it just kind of goes in between, but it doesn't stay 55. And you don't want to go too slow. Otherwise, you might get a ticket for uh, obstructing traffic. And that's only in the interstate. That's only in the interstate. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so you don't want to go too slow. Or, you know, everybody tells you you only have one friend and it's the middle finger or uh, you don't want to go too fast because you might get a ticket so speak, thinking of laws and all the laws that were put on the Jews the Jews were given laws and we're most familiar probably with the uh, Ten Commandments right a lot of us grew up learning the Ten Commandments uh, put simply first of all we're not to have any other gods except the one true God don't make idols. And I think idols doesn't just include like a wooden statue. It can include anything that we put before God, right? Don't use God's name in vain. Phone. My phone can be an idol. <laughs> and an I idol. iPhone. I, uh, that doesn't work. There's two eyes. All right. Anyway. <laughs> I, I. <laughs> uh, don't use God's name in vain. And I think, you know, so that... Often when you think about don't using God's name in vain, people think, well, don't use God's name as a cuss word, right? But I think it can also mean um, not putting God's name on something that's not of God. And you'll, you find church people or religious leaders doing that. They're doing stuff in the name of God that has nothing to do with God. We need to be careful of that as well, right? Amen. They had such a respect for God in, in the Old Testament uh, the scribes and stuff, that they wouldn't write out the name of God. If we were to do that today, you wrote God, you'd put G-D, you'd take the vowel out, because we are unworthy even to write the name God. So it's kind of interesting the amount of respect that they had for God back then, when a lot of Christians don't have that much respect for God today. We take God for granted. We you know, treat him flippantly. Anyway, that's, I don't want to get on that, because that's not what my sermon's about, and I could preach on that. <laughs> uh, keep the Sabbath day holy was the fourth one. Five, honor your father and mother. Six, don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't say false things about others. How many times has that been broken by church people? Saying false things about others. And then 10th, don't covet. So those are the Ten Commandments. Those are the ones probably we've, we've heard the most out of the Old Testament laws. Uh, Jesus paraphrased the Old Testament law with the two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But if you go back and read uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, uh, the th last three books of the Pentateuch, which is the most respected and cherished 
first five books of the Old Testament that the Jews uh, believed in. They loved the law, the Old Testament law. Those first five books of the Bible, by the time the scribes were adults, they had those books memorized. They could quote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They could just quote it. They knew it. That's what they went to school for. Uh, the Jewish boys going to school, they would memorize chunks of it. But if you went and uh, decided to make, take a career out of working for God as a scribe or as a lawyer or uh, being a Pharisee or Sadducee or whatever, you, know, you, would, you would memorize the Pentateuch. And there's a lot of laws in there. And uh, we see over and over again in the Old Testament where the Jews had a lot of trouble following those laws. Over and over we have stories of the Jewish people messing up. And God either coming to their rescue or God letting them fall flat on their face. And sometimes God does that with us. When we decide we're going to do things our own way, we're going to disobey God, uh, sometimes he'll come in and come to our rescue, and sometimes we have to fall on our, flat on our face before we learn our lesson, right? Amen. In the Old Testament, we see story after story of the Jewish people unable to fulfill the law. And then we skip ahead to the, the Gospels. We see the Jewish people. There were Pharisees and, and religious scribes and just people that had dedicated themselves to obeying the law. And they did a lot better job of obeying the Old Testament law. But Jesus got upset at them. Anyway, they, they were living out the law. They were good at following it. But God wasn't in their heart. That's what can happen with legalism in the church, is we get really good at having all these rules. Well, if you're a good Christian, you'll do this, you'll do that, you'll do this, you won't do that, you know. And we can come up with all these rules of what a good Christian is supposed to look like, but that doesn't mean we're right with God here. And God realized that that's a problem. We need God here. We need to be able to follow God's ways here before it comes to pass out here. Make sense? So let's look in Jeremiah 31. God's talking about how he was going to fix this. Verse 31, so 31, 31. <clears throat> the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions, I'll put my law within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. We just sang that. My iniquity is so vast. They're blotted out at last. So God was going to make a new covenant where he no longer remembered our sins and where he wrote his instruction, his commandments, his law on our hearts. So it came from the inside out. Father, I pray for your anointing upon your word today and your anointing upon our ears so that we can hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to your church. I ask the name of Jesus. Amen. So we've got a couple problems. The first of all that was getting in the way of the Jewish people fulfilling the law of God was that there was something in the hearts of the people that pushed them towards rebellion. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, we don't deal with that anymore, do we? <laughs> something inside of us that pushes us to put ourselves first. What's that? Temptation. Temptation. See, everybody's tempted. Even Jesus faced temptation. 
So we're all tempted, but it goes beyond that because there was something inside of the Jewish people that pushed them towards rebellion, that pushed them to disobey God. There was an evil in them, a sinful nature in them that pushed them not to live God's way, but their own way. And that was a problem. Laws are good, but they're only effective when people are willing to obey them. Now, they can come up with all sorts of laws. If the people aren't willing to obey them, what good are the laws? People are going to do their own thing anyway. And God can tell us how he wants us to live. But if we haven't fallen in love with God and our hearts haven't been changed so that we put God first, then we aren't going to follow God's ways. Because it doesn't come from here. There will be, still be something in us that pushes us towards selfishness. To put our ways above God's ways. As people, we want to choose how to live. We want to decide, right? We want to be in charge. We want our freedom. We want our rights. Which is what this nation was built upon. Our freedom. However, it can become a problem because our God complex can keep us from living for God. A lot of people have a God complex where they want to be in charge, where they get to decide. God has no say because they're in charge of their lives. And that way leads to destruction. That way leads to heartache. That way the way, there's a way that seems right to us, but in the end leads to death and destruction, right? That's what scripture tells us. And so we want to be in charge. We want to call the shots. We want to have the final say. So our God complex gets in the way of us following God, living for God, experiencing God. So that's a problem. The first problem was that there was something in the hearts of the people of Israel that pushed them away from God, that pushed them towards rebellion, that pushed them to make selfish choices to disobey. The second problem is that preaching rules, you know, you had these rules, this law. So pre standing up here every Sunday and preaching rules to you, teaching morals, telling you how you're supposed to live, a pastor teaching us how to be a do-gooder will never change our hearts. Knowing the rules doesn't make someone a good person. Repenting and being determined, I'm going to do better next time, always crashes and burns and defeats. Because we won't do better next time. There's only one person who ever lived a holy life, and that was Jesus Christ. And our only hope of living a holy life is not thinking, I'll do better next time. It's thinking, God, I surrender all. I will seek you, God. I will put you first. I will pursue you first. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Yet a lot of Christians are still living in slavery to the wrong thing. In Romans 6.16 it says, Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves of the one you obey, right? That's true whether you serve as slaves of sin, which leads to death, or as slaves of the kind of obedience that leads to righteousness. We're all selling ourselves to something. We can either sell ourselves to God or we can sell ourselves to ourselves, us being in charge. And what that always leads to is us giving control to other things, giving control to addictions, giving control to our job, giving control to money. You know, there's all these things out there seeking to control people. But there's only freedom when we find God. When we sin, we are selling ourselves as slaves to sin. And feeling sorry won't free us from that sin. 
Uh, Self-effort. Trying really hard. Focusing on the rules. Focusing on, I need to be a good Christian. Focusing on these things will never free us. What it's like is uh, putting lipstick on a pig, right? I think I've heard a preacher say that before. We can get all gussied up on the outside and still be rotten on the inside. Jesus tells the religious leaders that they were like whitewashed tombs. Like a mausoleum that's been all fixed up and painted and looks nice on the, ins- on the outside, but on the inside is full of dead men's bones. And we can come to church and we can act the part and we can look the part, we can dress the part, but inside still be dead. God shows us in this passage and in many other passages that he's not content with us just looking the part. He wants us to be in love with him. He wants his instructions inscribed on our hearts so that living for God comes from here, not from here. So we have the two problems. First is that there's something in us that pushes us to disobey. And second, learning the rules and learning how we're supposed to behave won't actually set us free. The solution we find in verse 33. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. God gives us a new heart, freed from the slavery of sin, our innermost selves set free. When will this happen? God says here, I will make a new covenant. When did the new covenant happen? When Jesus went to the cross and rose from the dead and the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. That is the new covenant. A covenant of grace where God takes our heart of stone away. Our hardened heart our selfish, sinful heart, and replaces it with a heart of flesh that is sensitive to God, that is filled with the presence and power of God through the Holy Spirit, where his ways are now inscribed inside of us. You know, the world wants nothing to do with a God who confronts our sin. But God wants to go beyond just confronting it. He wants to destroy sin in us. He wants to confront it and then destroy it. Sanctifying us entirely. Taking that old and throwing it away and putting a new heart, a new spirit, a new life within us. God wants to give us a holy heart. Only an inner transformation will make an outer lasting change. Let me say that again. Only an inner transformation will make an outer lasting change, right? Holiness of heart means transformation by God's grace, enabling us to live holiness, loving the way we should, being Christ-like. So the point of all this is that if you've been trying to do it, if you've been trying to live the Christian life, if you've been trying to live the way God wants you to, stop it. You aren't going to do it. Surrender is the only way. We can try really hard and burn ourselves out. Over and over again, I've seen Christians who tried so hard and have burned themselves out trying. I've seen Christians, uh, leaders, who thought they were obeying God, but then money or other things got in the way, and they fell from their position because the first thing stopped being first. They were trying to be a good minister instead of trying to pursue God. The only one that can live the Christian life is Jesus. 
And our only hope of living the Christian life is getting out of his way and letting him do it. And we see that in this passage where God says, I'll make a new covenant. You tried to live a holy life and you couldn't do it. I'm going to take your heart. I'm going to put away the old. I'm going to put in the new. I'm going to put my spirit within you. You don't have to have people tell you this is the way you should live. As it says in verse 34, know the Lord. No one will have to tell you know the Lord because they'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is the one that taps us on the shoulder and say, hey, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. Check your attitude. Anybody else have the Holy Spirit ever say that to you? Check your attitude. Don't type that. <laughs> this is how good God is. Not only does he save us, he also saves us from ourselves. He doesn't just want us to go to heaven. He wants us to experience that eternal life here on earth, that abundant life. He wants us to be free from chains, free from what the dominion of sin has done. God wants to do more in our lives than most Christians will ever allow him to do. He wants to set you free. He wants to set me free. So the big idea, the big question for today is how is your heart? How is your heart with God today? Does he have it all? Have you given everything to God? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to instruct? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you, to guide you? Have you been trying to do it yourself? That never works. How's your heart with God today? And I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about something deeper. Is God on the throne? Is God in charge? Has the Holy Spirit been given free reign to do what he needs to do? Is your all on the altar? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Just between you and God. Give your heart to God again. Give it to him. Hold nothing back. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. Father, we give it all to you today. Everything in our hearts and lives, everything that's weighing us down and burdening us, God, we give to you. We cast all of our cares, all of our lives on you because we trust you. We don't want to be like Thomas where we have to see you come through before we believe in you. We want to, we want to believe in you. Give us faith to just trust you. Give us faith to just surrender to you. And trust you, God, to come through because you will every time. Help us, Lord, give it all to you to place our entire selves on the altar. And help us, Lord, to be open to the instructions of the Holy Spirit. Allowing you, God, to speak to us. Allowing you, God, to direct us. And anything in us, Lord, that is getting in the way of following you completely, I pray, God, you'll convict us of. And you'll deal with. More of you, God, is what we need. More of you. Help us, Lord, not to be content with casual Christianity, but to completely surrender and sell out to you, God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.